welcome back to the next episode of What's Up Prof. Hello, Walter. Good day. <laughs> How are you doing? Uh, the same as yesterday and the day before. Oh. I'm actually quite fine. Oh, that's good. I'm glad. Let's open with a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you again that we can get together. Lord, would you please enlighten our minds once again and help us discern the truth from the error. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're going to answer a few questions again. Question time. Yes. Um, I'll get right into it. First question that we have is, where did Cain get his wife? Well, that is not something that is too complicated. There was one pair that was created, and that was Adam and Eve. Mm. And they were perfect. Their genetic system was immaculate. There was no fault in it whatsoever. So they had children, and they had many children. We don't know how many. We know of a few of them, but we don't know about the rest. So they had sons and daughters. Now they were probably over 900 years old when they died, and let's say if we take that in today's term, then they should have been uh, fertile in terms of producing children to at least 400, if not 500 years. Mm. So how many children did Eve have? We don't know. But she had many daughters and many sons. And because there were no genetic aberrations whatsoever, there was no problem if one married his sister. So Cain married his sister. And this was allowed to continue in the early generations. Eventually, because of the fall, genetic aberrations came in and there were restrictions placed. If you go up to the time of Abraham, mm. Abraham still married his half-sister. Yes. So that was still perfectly permissible. It wasn't the same both parents were the same, but one of them was the same. And then as you f carry on, eventually the restrictions become greater and you shouldn't marry uh, within the very close confines of the family because of the genetic aberrations. Mm. But in the early ones, there were no genetic aberrations. So I assume that the wife that Cain married was the rebellious one. <laughs> And she sympathized with him. And when Cain was banished, she says, well, if he goes, I go. Mm. And that is where the line of Cain started. So the early first children married their siblings. Should a Christian date or marry a non-Christian? Whoa. Mm. You don't know who asked this one, right? No. <laughs> Okay, should a Christian date or marry a non-Christian? Now, this is a, a very serious issue, and uh, the answer is not one that uh, is very simple. But uh, let's just look at some Bible verses. 2 Corinthians 6.14 says, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion has light with darkness? So the Bible clearly tells us that we should not be yoked together with unbelievers. Mm. Now, if you're married, then you're yoked, yoked. together. Mm. Now, that was a problem from the beginning, and that's where uh, the system went wrong. Because right in the beginning in the Bible it says, and the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful and they started marrying them. Mm -hmm. So this is the line that followed the line of Seth and the line of Cain. And the line of Cain, they were the daughters of men. Mm -hmm. And the line of Seth, those were the sons of God. Because everybody who was aligned with uh, with the truth and with God, they were the sons of God. But eventually, they went shopping in the malls of those days and saw hmm, the daughters of men are, are rather beautiful and started marrying them. And that's where things went wrong. Yeah. 
you can go through the history of the Bible. What happened to Solomon? Mm. He eventually, exactly the same went thing. Went down the same route. He went down the same road, and it led to a terrible, terrible decline in the spirituality of the whole nation. So it is never a good thing to be unequally yoked. Mm. Now we know that it does happen, but biblically, it is not recommended. In fact, if you take the the text as it reads, it is forbidden. Yes. Now we do many things that are forbidden in this world, and uh, men are subject to human weakness. And I assume the woman at the well who had five <laughs> men, and the one that she was living with was not her husband, was also not doing the will of God. But God had compassion on her. Yeah. So if you read the Bible, it is strictly forbidden. If you read the spirit of prophecy, it is strictly forbidden. But it does happen. Now what does happen when it, when it happens? Well, there's another verse in the Bible, which is 1 Corinthians 7.14, which is a very interesting verse. It says, For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, this, this, of course, uh, obviously means a, a wife that is in the faith. Yes. Because can something clean come out of something unclean? No. And the answer in the Bible is also clear. No. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife. So we could actually put a, a, a word in there, believing wife. And the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband, or the believing husband, as it were. Else were your children unclean, but now they are holy. So the Bible makes provision for the fact that it does happen. So if an unbelieving husband is married to a believing wife, their children will be considered clean on the basis that either the wife or the husband or in the faith. Mm. But it's safer to say if you have a choice before, then you, you follow should, the first one. Then you follow the first one. If it does happen and an unbelieving husband or wife marries an unbelieving or believing uh, partner, then you will have conflict in that marriage. And it depends how deep that conflict runs and how much tolerance there is. So then in that case, one stays married and prays, and through the example that the believing wife or the believing husband sets in the household, tries to win the other one over. And if the other one refuses to be brought over, then you will have to sit with that situation. Mm -hmm. So better to avoid the situation in the first place. Yes, so that is the answer. It's not a very pleasing answer to most, but that is what the Bible teaches. Amen. What is the meaning of the biblical feasts? Should we still keep the biblical feasts? Now, there's a lot of contention on that issue, right? Yes. And uh, there's a lot of history attached to it. And uh, the feasts are, of course, types mm -hmm. pointing to a greater reality. So I think we should, we should spend a little time on this one and perhaps just go through a few mm. points. I think that will be good. And to see how this one can be applied in the time that we are living in. So the question is, to feast or not to feast? And uh, depending who you talk to, you will get a particular opinion. Yes. If we go through the, to the spirit of prophecy, it tells us that in a special sense, Seventh-day Adventists have been set in the world as watchmen and light bearers. To them has been entrusted the last warning for a perishing world. On them is shining wonderful light from the word of God. They have been given a work of the most solemn import, the proclamation of the first, second, and third angels' messages. There is no other work of so great importance, 
They to, are to allow nothing else to absorb their attention. Now, we've been doing that for a whole year now, mm -hmm. and prior to that for numerous years. But what is the message that has to go to the world? The first, the second, and the third angel's messages. Now, we know that the first angel's message is the entire gospel virtually. Yes. Because it says, uh, I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven having the everlasting gospel mm -hmm. to proclaim. And then it says, you must worship God who is the creator right. of all things. And then the second angel's message goes to those who refuse the fullness of this message. And then the third angel's message deals with obedience to God's requirements. Mm. And when you are obedient to his requirements, then you accept the justification that comes from him. In other words, the obedience that you have is flowing out of your acceptance of the grace that God has given you. It's not a means to salvation, it's a consequence of salvation. Mm. So that is the job. Are we supposed to go into the world and preach a message that you have to believe this, that and the other, or you have to believe in the feasts, or you have to believe in whatever message there is that detracts from the proclamation of this. What is the center of your message is the point that I'm making. Mm -hmm. This should be the, the center of your message, the three angels' messages. And what you believe about the feasts is always secondary to this. In Acts chapter 15 we read, And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. And here they taught that a ceremonial law mm -hmm. was essential to salvation. Mm. Because they said, if you're not circumcised, you cannot be saved. So the question is, are the feasts ceremonial or are they not ceremonial? Mm. That's the issue, That's right? That's the issue. Okay. Circumcision was obviously ceremonial, ceremonial. Because it pointed to the circumcision of the heart. Mm. Acts chapter 15 verse 2 says, When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them. So was it a hot issue? Yes. So these issues can be very hot. Mm -hmm. Now, <laughs> this is quite a euphemism. Because when it says they had no small dissension, what does that mean? It was a big dissension. It was a big issue. So some people make very big issues out of out of things like these and they will make it salvational mm. if you don't understand it like i understand it you will not go to heaven. heaven okay and they determined that paul and barnabas and certain other of them should go up to jerusalem unto the apostles and elders about this question so it became so heated that not even the authority of Paul and Barnabas was trusted by these people. Do we have similar circumstances today? Definitely. We have, we have many issues mm -hmm. that are raging, even within our own ranks, whether you're talking about the feast issue, whether you're talking about the Trinity issue. There are so many things that seem to be absolutely salvational. General to many people. We want to do justice to it. We don't want to be judgmental. Mm. But we need to look at the issue, right? Correct. We read on, But there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees, which believed, saying that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. So it wasn't only circumcision. It was the entire law of Moses. Mm. Now, the law of Moses was ceremonial. Yes. It was the ceremonial law. So they included the entire ceremonial law in this issue and said, well, nothing has changed. We must still keep them as they were, all the laws. Yeah. 
ceremonial and moral. And so they had a gathering, and it's a very important gathering. It was like a general conference, conference. gathering. And the apostles and the elders came together for to consider this matter. And when there had been much disputing, and so did they resolve this issue easily? No. No. <laughs> did everybody agree on it? No. <laughs> There was much disputing, so there were obviously two sides to the story, right? Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, you know how that a good while ago God made choice amongst us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. He's referring to Cornelius. Mm -hmm and uh, that he had seen this sheet come down full of unclean animals, and the Jews considered uh, the Gentiles unclean, and he was emphatically commanded not to call that unclean which God had declared clean. clean yeah. And so he went to Cornelius, and Cornelius fell at his feet, and he said, Do it not, I'm just a fellow human being like you are. So he wasn't acting like a pope, right? No. And... Then he said to Cornelius, You know that it is unlawful for me as a Jew to associate with a Gentile, mm. but God has shown me in vision that I should not call any man impure or unclear. Yeah. And to which law did he refer? It's unlawful for me to you? And that part was part of, of the, the ceremonial law. And Moses' law. Moses' yes. law. So there was much disputing amongst them, and Peter made this speech. And by the way, no, Paul sorry. was also called to the, be an apostle to the Gentiles. But uh, they wouldn't accept his authority and that issue, so they referred it to the apostles. So after much disputing, this is where it came to. And then they wrote letters by them after this manner. The apostles and elders and brethren sent greetings unto the brethren which are of the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia. Now, this is how it worked in those days. The authority lay in a vote of the entire assembly. So who voted? The apostles, the elders, and the brethren that came together. And they sent greetings unto the brethren, mm -hmm. which are of the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia. So there was a, a conference, and the brethren as a unit decided. Now, of course, if you have a new translation, they will put a comma, and they'll say the apostles of elders, and leave that brethren out, and just say they wrote to the brethren. So there you have a hierarchy. Mm. But in God's church, everybody is equal. For as much as we have heard that certain which went out from us have troubled you with words, subverting your souls, saying you must be circumcised and keep the law, in other words, the ceremonial law, that the Moses law was still given by God to Moses. Absolutely. So that's why it's important that you mention the ceremonial law. But the moral law was written on stone yes. by the finger of God, God and was placed in the ark, mm -hmm. and the ceremonial law was handwritten by Moses and placed beside the ark. Yes. It seemed good unto us being assembled with one accord. In other words, that's how the vote went to send chosen men unto you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul. Now, this is interesting. They didn't just go with a letter. They sent witnesses. Yeah. Because the people were so fired up, it was no small contention, that they would probably have rejected what Paul yeah. and Barnabas said anyway. So they sent witnesses that it really was so. Now, what did they decide? This is now in Galatians chapter 2, verse 9. We get a little bit more of an insight, right? When James and Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, 
they gave to me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship that we should go unto the heathen and they unto the circumcision. So this is in the early church when Paul was sent to go and preach to the Gentiles. Yes. So they had the blessing of the chief of the apostles, James, Kephas, which is Peter, mm -hmm. and John. John. Only they would that we should remember the poor, the same which I also was forward to do. And then this little word, word but. <laughs> <laughs> when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to it the face because he was to be blamed. For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. And the other Jews dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. What is Paul saying here? Now uh, Peter had just said that they were of one accord. Yes. All right. They all agreed. Mm. Okay. You don't have to do this thing. And they sent letters and they signed it. And we were of one accord. Mm -hmm. And James got up at that meeting and he made a speech. And he was the one that summed it up and said, okay, we won't put all of these restrictions that the Jews had, which neither our fathers or we could bear. And so we admonish you to abstain from, from food that is strangled from taking blood. Right. So he kept the health laws, right? Mm -hmm. And that uh, this is no longer required of you. It basically, it has been fulfilled in the New Testament. But then James, who was at that stage the spokesman, seemed to have had second thoughts. And he had little discussions with certain men that came from James, and they seem to have uh, <laughs> worked with the mind of Peter. And so Peter was swayed from his very beautiful speech that he had made, because before he didn't mind eating with the Gentiles, mm. and now all of a sudden he had a problem, right? And not only that, and the other Jews dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that even Barnabas, who in the beginning was so strong in arguing against it, was swayed. So are these issues contentious within the church? Yes. Exceedingly so. Exceedingly. Exceedingly so. We must be very careful, very circumspect, and we should not allow dissension to come into our ranks because of a misunderstanding or a different interpretation of an issue. Our job mm -hmm. is to preach the three angels' mm -hmm. messages. So let's get back to the feasts. There were seven annual Jewish feasts, and they served as a type and an anti-type. Now, the type, if we go to them, Passover. What was the antitype of the Passover? It was the crucifixion, yes. right? Mm -hmm. Because they had to take a lamb without blemish. They had to, in their clan, in their family, consume the entire lamb. Mm. It had to be prepared with bitter herbs. Now, just, just take that as an example. Firstly, there was no blood in that animal because mm -hmm. the blood was completely washed out mm -hmm. because completely. blood was forbidden. Mm -hmm. they, they were even so strict that they, they washed it out with salt water. So it was an extremely bland product. Mm -hmm. And then it was prepared with bitter herbs. So it was not something not that you relished. No. Not not some like not nice a a barbecue. barbecue or a spit. In a no, 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 no. It was not something that you relished. And it was probably a smallish lamb. And the whole family, mm. now the family included the whole extended family, 
and if there were not enough of them you could take uh, others in with the party so each one had a piece and it had to be consumed now the typology is very interesting if you want to internalize christ in other words the character of christ how much of him do you want to internalize yeah all of him all of it mm. that was the symbolism mm -hmm. but because one man couldn't consume it all it was spread over the entire clan of the entire family and it was a better morsel mm. now uh, when you change your your lifestyle when you change your view when you become a christian out of a, a worldly situation that is a bitter draught to drink yes but you have to drink it mm -hmm. you have to drink that cup to the dregs yeah. and then it becomes sweet in your stomach right in your stomach but the still the walk is quite bitter absolutely so the passover and this feast that took place on that day was a type of the crucifixion now the antitype the crucifixion is of course greater than the type which was just a shadow pointing towards it so when christ was crucified what point was there in keeping the passover yeah that is fulfilled and then it is fulfilled now some people say it was not fulfilled the early church there is a good record that they still okay. took part in the festivals mm -hmm. but they were still arguing about many many issues yes. and as the knowledge of the typology unfolded they changed over time yes the next feast was the feast of unleavened bread this was the very next day in Nisan 15 and the body that was broken this bread said jesus symbolizes my body okay. right that was broken for you and that symbolizes christ in the grave the sinless one became sin for us so was christ in the grave fulfilling the type of unleavened bread yes yes the next feast was the next day so that was the feast of first fruits mm -hmm. and that typified the resurrection so you had feast and you had the antitype feast and the antitype feast and the antitype then you had the feast of weeks mm -hmm. now that was sivan 6 and that typified pentecost now pentecost is when people were empowered to preach christ in other words the holy spirit was poured out to empower the disciples of christ to preach the gospel mm. that's why it was poured out plus all the other functions of the holy spirit of course but the outpouring was to preach the gospel, gospel yeah. the holy spirit had always been there before and he convicted of sin and righteousness and justice mm -hmm. and all of these issues and led you to the word but pentecost was an outpouring to preach christ wow. right yep. now my question to you is did that happen only once and never thereafter no nope. Or is the Holy Spirit constantly being poured out and the gospel preached to every single generation? Yes. Can I therefore keep one day when Pentecost has already taken place and has become a continuum? No, that will make null and void the, the, gospel, the gospel, commission. gospel commission. Okay, so now uh, here's the problem. If the feast is absolutely essential, do I then have to wait for that particular day to have an experience with the Holy Spirit? It's just a question it's I'm asking. Question. I'm not being vindictive. Yeah. I'm just asking the question. Let's carry on. Then there was the Feast of Trumpets. Now, this heralded the, the judgment. That's what the trumpets were there for. And this was Tishri 1. So this heralded the second Advent movement. Mm. 
Uh, has that taken place already? Yes. Yes. And then there was the Day of Atonement, one of the most important days on the calendar. Mm. And it prefigured the pre-Advent judgment. So the Day of Atonement was a day in which you afflicted your soul and made right what was wrong and came into harmony with God because judgment was at hand. And Christ already announced that judgment had come when he'd come to the earth. Yes. And then finally you have the Feast of Tabernacles, mm -hmm. which is homegoing, or the Second Advent. So theoretically you could say that the Feast of Tabernacles is not yet fulfilled because we haven't gone home yet. Mm. But if you accept that Christ has promised that he would come again, that he would prepare a place, then when you accept Christ, don't you believe that you will be going home with him? So by faith, it has already been fulfilled. Mm. Well, is the Feast of Tabernacles only when the second coming comes or is it also in waiting for it? Yes, you are waiting so for it. So we are in the Feast of Tabernacles continually. And in a sense, within the Adventist church at least, we used to have, before the lockdown, something called camp meetings, mm. which were almost a type of uh, a feast of tabernacles. You tabernacle together and you bathed yourself in the knowledge that Christ was going to come and take you home soon. Now, why is it that of late, there is this massive movement to bring the feasts back. Where did it start? Mm -hmm. Because if you go through the history of the church, the early church had some relics of it. Then it disappeared completely. Yeah. The Reformation never mm -hmm. brought it up. Mm -mm. So it's a new thing that the feasts must now be kept again, right? So where did this actually start? Well, you can go back to Vatican II and the Jewish question. And this is interesting. So the existing links between the Christian liturgy and the Jewish liturgy will be borne in mind, so said Vatican II. To improve Jewish-Christian relations, it's important to take cognizance of those common elements of the liturgical life, formulas, feasts, rites, etc., in which the Bible holds an essential place. So where does this come from? This comes from the documents of Vatican II, Austin P. Flannery, page 743. So these, this is a Vatican II decision that to find common ground between Christianity and Judaism, mm -hmm. we need to reactivate the feasts. Yeah. Vatican II document, page 744, Christians must therefore strive to acquire a better knowledge of the basic components of the religious tradition of Judaism. They must strive to learn by what essential traits the Jews define themselves in the light of their own religious experience. So what the early council said, the Gentiles did not have to yes. concern themselves with, the Vatican II council decided you have to concern yourself with. And we always have this. Whenever, yeah. whenever the Bible says one thing, Rome says another. No. We're yeah. quite used to that mm -hmm. by now. Let's read on. This is Vatican II document, page 747. The history of Judaism did not end with the destruction of Jerusalem, but rather went on to develop a religious tradition. And although we believe that the importance and meaning of that tradition was deeply affected by the coming of Christ, it is still nonetheless rich in religious values. Now that might be true, mm -hmm. that it had or has to them religious values, but does it mean that they have to be applied to the Christian today? No. This is not necessarily, no. right? 
Research into the problems bearing on Judaism and the Jewish-Christian relations will be encouraged among specialists. So that's interesting. You have to be a specialist in order to make this comparison. And then I guess the specialist is the one that tells you what you have to do, right? Correct. Does the Bible work like that? No. I, I have never read that the Bible says that. The Bible says that you must study for yourselves and then you make the decision, exactly. right? Here you have a coach and he's going to tell you what to do. Okay. Wherever possible, chairs of Jewish studies will be created and collaboration with Jewish scholars encouraged. So this is something that they want to permeate through the whole of Christianity. And it comes from Vatican II. Well, when that happens, then my antennas go up. <laughs> Hebrews 8.13 and that he says, a new covenant, he has made the first old. Now that which decayeth and waxes old is ready to vanish away. So clearly the Bible teaches that certain portions of the old covenant are no longer applicable. Mm -hmm. That's what the Bible teaches. Rome says it's an important tradition, therefore you will keep it. I've come to almost believe that whenever Rome says something, yeah. the opposite is true. Almost, yeah. <laughs> almost. <laughs> and another thing that a lot of people now do is with this waxing old part of the old covenant, they throw in the Sabbath. In uh -huh. But we've discussed that many times. The Sabbath is part of the moral law. Yes. And it's the heart of the moral law. It is not part of the ceremonial law, no. although it is included. Yes. And the feast days are called ceremonial Sabbaths. Yes. And according to Colossians, which we dealt with mm -hmm. in a previous one, those have been removed. They've been nailed to the cross. cross. In other words, they're obsolete. The ceremonial Sabbaths. Yeah. Now remember, the feasts always were associated with sacrifices, yes. sacrificial systems. Now, if you do make a sacrifice, then you're actually denying that the antitypical lamb has been sacrificed yes. because then you are using a type. So if you want to remove the sacrificial system, you've actually taken the heart out of the feast. Yes. There's no point. There is no point to keep on holding a day <coughs> that you've, if you don't have any sacrifice on it. Exactly. But what about the sacrifices that were done daily? And yeah, there then was also on the Sabbath. Absolutely. So this, this fact that Jesus was going to die with you was such an important component that there was a morning and an evening sacrifice daily, which also took place on the Sabbath. But the sacrificial system came to an end, mm. which means the sacrificial system on the Sabbath also came to an end. So that but has that nothing to do with the with Sabbath. the Sabbath, because no. the Sabbath wa was created for a different Reason. thing. It's not for the anti-typical um, creation to, that showed towards Jesus. Exactly. So the Sabbath pointed back to creation. creation. Remember the Sabbath, because in six days the Lord made the heavens, the earth, and the springs of water, right? It pointed backwards to creation. The ceremonial Sabbaths pointed forward to Christ, the reality being Christ. Yes. So what does Ephesians tell us about this? Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14. For he is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of partition between us, talking about the Jews and the Gentiles, having abolished in his flesh mm. the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances. That is is the law of Moses. That's what it was called. It was the written, the handwriting of Moses. For to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace. So according to this verse, the handwriting of ordinances, which is the ceremonial law, was removed. So which laws still pertain to us? Number one, the moral law. That's written in stone. You don't touch it. You don't add to it. You don't take away from it. It stands forever. Mm -hmm. Who interprets that law? God does. Mm. 
The Jew says, you were breaking the Sabbath by healing a man. He said, no, I'm Lord of the Sabbath. I'll tell you how it is kept. Correct. He didn't break it. No. He never broke the Sabbath. No. He only broke the, the Sabbath according to the Jews' exactly. tradition and yes. their laws. He is the Lord of the Sabbath. He'll tell you what the meaning yeah. of the Sabbath is. That doesn't is. mean that, like many people want to allure, that because he's Lord of the Sabbath, he could break it. Exactly. That doesn't, no, that's not that doesn't all work that about. That's, that is not the character of God. The law is a transcript of his character. And thank God it is a oh, transcript of his character. And that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. The ceremonial law was placed besides the ark as a testimony against you. Mm. The moral law told you what sin was. Yes. So when you looked in a mirror, mirror, you saw that you were a sinner. But the ceremonial law actually said to you, you are responsible for the death of the Lamb. Mm. That's against you. And God took that upon himself and became that antitypical Lamb and took my guilt and my sin upon him, which is absolutely astounding. Mm. The ceremonial law could not set you free. No. Only God could do that. That's why Jesus had to die. Yes. And the ceremonial law was called a shadow mm. because the substance was Christ. But keeping the moral law can set you free. Okay. Can I hit you with my shadow? No. No. But I can with my hand, right? <laughs> okay. So this is what it clearly says the handwriting of ordinances or the commandments contained in ordinances, exactly the same thing. Whether you're referring to Colossians or Ephesians, it's talking about the ceremonial law. So if we go to Colossians, it says blotting out the handwriting of ordinances, which is the same thing, mm -hmm. ceremonial law, that was against us. Mm. We've just explained that, why it was against us which was contrary to us and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. And then this verse that always creates problems, let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a holy day. The Greek there is ortos feast day or festival. Mm -hmm or of a new moon, or of the Sabbath days, plural. Now, all of these feast days were also ceremonial Sabbath days. And they were nailed to the cross, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Mm. So they were a shadow pointing to Jesus Christ. So yes. let no one judge you in Meat, that is food, that's old English, it doesn't mean, if it was meat like we say today, it would say flesh, yes. right? So the King James talks about an animal tissue as flesh and meat is food. food. Food or drink. Now, does the Sabbath contain anything about eating and drinking? No. No, it's a, a reminder of where you come from. Yes. Do the ceremonial la laws contain eating and drinking? Yes. Absolutely. So in other words, let no one judge you in eating or drinking all the feast days, mm -hmm. all the new moons, all the sad and Sabbath days, plural. Yes. The new moons also determined the feast days. Yes. Now if you have a new translation, mm -hmm. they violate this verse and they make that Sabbath day with a capital S, yes. and thereby actually include the moral law. Correct. So the new translations, th based on the Alexandrian text, mm -hmm. are, in my opinion, in this verse, nothing short of diabolical. They are a shadow of things to come. They are a type pointing to the great anti-type. Mm -hmm. And according to this, they no longer apply. Now, let's take a look at what the Spirit of Prophecy says. In the Desire of Ages, we have a very interesting section. It says there, on page 652 to 653, the following. 
Christ was standing at the point of transition between two economies and their two great festivals. So now she's only talking about two, but it's about the feasts, right? He, the spotless Lamb of God, was about to present himself as a sin offering that he would thus bring to an end the system of types and ceremonies that for 4,000 years had pointed to his death. Bring an end to the system of types and ceremonies. As he ate the Passover with his disciples, he instituted in its place mm -hmm. the service that was to be the memorial of his great sacrifice the national festival of the Jews was to pass away forever. The service which Christ established was to be observed by his followers in all lands and through all ages. So she's referring here particularly to the Passover. Mm. And in its place, he instituted the communion service. Yes. In its place. And the first was to pass away forever. forever. If it applies to one, that was typological. Doesn't it apply to all? Yes. In my opinion, it does. In many other people's opinions, it won't. Because there was no small contention between them. <laughs> Correct. Here's an article in the Review and Herald. And by the way, People might say, but that is Ellen White. But what she's saying is absolutely in harmony with the scripture. Yeah. In this ordinance, the Last Supper or Communion, Christ discharged his disciples from the cares and burdens of the ancient Jewish obligations in rites and ceremonies. That's pretty clear, isn't it? Mm -hmm. These no longer possessed any virtue, for type was meeting anti-type in himself. What does the Catholic Church say? They have a deep tradition and therefore they are of value today and we'll have to appoint specialists mm -hmm. to see how we can join these two and then have these specialists inform the churches that they must introduce this into their religious systems so that we have commonality with the Jews. So that we're going to have commonality between those that believe that Jesus was the Messiah and those that don't, don't believe, believe that he was the Messiah. They're going to have solidarity. Solidarity. <laughs> okay. So let's read that again. These no longer possessed any virtue, for type was meeting anti-type in himself. The authority and foundation of all Jewish ordinances that pointed to him as the great and only efficacious offering for the sins of the world. Now, how many feasts are included in that statement? I think all of them. Okay. He gave this simple ordinance that it might be a special season when he himself would always be present to lead all participants in it to feel the pulse of their own conscience to awaken them to an understanding of the lessons symbolized, to revive their memory, to convict of sin, and to receive their penitential repentance. He would teach them that brother is not to exalt himself above brother, that the dangers of disunion and strife shall be seen and appreciated, for the health and the holy activity of the soul are involved. So the foot washing ceremony mm -hmm. was to remind us that we have to be in association with humility when we deal with each other. And this ordinance was the great reminder of his great sacrifice. Now, when the Jews brought a lamb, it was the same thing. They were to consider the message that was embodied in the slaughtering of the lamb. But it became a ritual yes. to them. And blood flowing mm. was more important. Later they wanted to walk yes, ankle deep in the blood so that they stopped could the drainage. In the they stopped the drains. Where does it say that in the Bible? <sighs> then ritual becomes important. Mm. Now that's exactly what Rome loves. Rome loves 
ritual. Mm -hmm. God loves faith. Sacrifice an offering you did not desire. What he wants is humble obedience. But the sacrificial system was given as a type and a reminder of why and He's how done. sin was yeah. to be dealt with. Exodus 12, verse 14, And this day shall be unto you for a memorial, and you shall keep it a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. The Hebrew is olam anoyos. You shall keep it forever. What do you do with that now? Mm -hmm. Well, when you accept Christ, and you internalize the message of the feast, then you are keeping it forever that he is the Lamb of God that was sacrificed for your sins. And in the ordinance that was put in its place, you continue to be reminded of it. Mm. So let's put it this way. The feast isn't actually gone. It's been incorporated mm. and swallowed up that's why Jesus said he came to fulfill it. He didn't come to say it wasn't worth anything or something Absolutely like that. Absolutely not. He came and said, I am now the full embodiment of this. Yes, and because they made it a ritual, if you read Isaiah, he says that your feasts are abhorrent to me. Mm. Exodus 12, verse 17, And ye shall observe the feast of unleavened bread, for in this selfsame day have I brought your armies out of the land of Egypt. Therefore shall you observe this day in your generations by an ordinance forever. What does the unleavened bread point to? Also to the sinlessness of Jesus. Yes. He said, this is my body that was given unto you. It was broken for you. Now when you, so when you take part in the communion service, do you not remember this? It is embodied. It has mm. been, let's use the word, absorbed mm. into that which has put, been put in the place thereof. Now, when Jesus said, your house has been left to you desolate, mm. that means empty. empty. And the sacrificial system was taken away completely, mm. right? And for 2,000 years almost, it's gone. Yeah. So for 2,000 years, there's been no sacrificial system. Now they want to revive it. If they revive it, what are they saying? That uh, Jesus didn't come. Exactly. This ordinance does not speak so largely to man's intellectual capacity as to his heart. Talking about the communion. His moral and spiritual nature needs it. If his disciples had not needed this, it would not have been left for them as Christ's last established ordinance in connection with and including the Last Supper. It was Christ's desire to leave his disciples an ordinance that would do for them the very thing they needed, that would serve, listen carefully, to disentangle them from the rites and ceremonies which they had hitherto engaged in as essential, and which the reception of the gospel made no longer of any force. To continue these rites would be an insult to Jehovah. Is that pretty clear? Yes. Now, again, people will say, but this is Ellen White. Mm. But is it in harmony with Scripture? Yes. Eating of the body and drinking of the blood of Christ, not merely at the sacramental service, but daily partaking of the bread of life to satisfy the soul's hunger, would be in receiving his word and doing his will. That is why the circumcision was taken away from a literal circumcision to a circumcision of the heart. There had to be a shift from ritual to inner understanding and acceptance. This is the only offering that is acceptable to God. And that is why the early church decided that it was no longer necessary to circumcise. Mm. 
well would it be for us to have a Feast of Tabernacles? Now, we spoke about that one, right? Mm -hmm. And said, that doesn't seem to be fulfilled. So let's just read what it says here. It's very interesting. It comes from the Review and Herald, November 17, 1885. A joyous commemoration of the blessings of God to us as a people. As the children of Israel celebrated the deliverance that God wrought for their fathers and his miraculous preservation of them during their journeyings from Egypt to the promised land, so should the people of God at the present time gratefully call to mind the various ways he has devised to bring them out from the world, out from the darkness of error into the precious light of truth. We should often, so do we have a ritual feast here that it's is repeated only once a year? No. No. Not a specific date, not a specific time or measured by the moon or nothing. Is there a specific time for the communion service? No. No. We should often bring to remembrance the dependence upon God of those who first led out in this work. We should gratefully regard the old way marks and refresh our souls with memories of the loving kindness of our gracious benefactor. So we have also been called out of Egypt. We have also been called to tabernacle. And that we do when we come together and we remember how God graciously called us from a life of sin to a life of walking in harmony with him. We are indeed strangers here and pilgrims to a better country. Our prospective home is the heavenly Canaan, where we shall drink of the pure river of the water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. But as we journey onward, what a blessed privilege is ours to accept the invitation of Christ. If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. Let us rejoice in the goodness of God and show forth the praises of him who has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. That is what, in my opinion, is left of the feasts. Thank you very much for that explanation. I think we can conclude with that for today. Will you close with a, for us with a word of prayer, yes. please? Heavenly Father, there are so many issues which can cause contention. And I pray, Lord, that you will bring a sense of unity to your children wherever they are in the world. Help us to concentrate on the essential things of the gospel for the times that we are living in so that we are not sidetracked with all of these issues. How much work can be left undone because of contention on issues where there can be such a diversity of thought? Bless your people and help us to be good soldiers of Christ, bringing the message of salvation to the world, preaching the three angels the message of warning and waiting for the soon coming of our King and Savior. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for watching this video. To subscribe, click here. When the bell appears, click again to get notifications. To watch the next video, Click here. Thank you.